All right. Guys, we're going to have the, the passage of Scripture come up here. It's uh, the passage that we've been focusing on for a while called uh, Beatitudes. And it's, uh, it's all about the attitudes that we as believers should have um, in our hearts and in our minds and be the, the philosophy or the way of life or the theology by which we, we live our Christian experience. So we're going to put it up. The whole thing is going to come on the screen. And uh, instead of just me reading it alone, I'm going to invite you to, to stand and read it with us. And then I have just a few thoughts to share with you on uh, Blessed Are the, the Merciful. So why don't you stand? Phil, is that thing ready to come up here? Let's all stand. We're going to read it together. Let's read it with me. And he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. It's fine, John. Thanks, boy. And be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Thanks, guys. Take a seat. For those of you who are visiting us, it's lovely to have the team here from Lake Point. We've been uh, working on this uh, series, going through the Beatitudes, and our intention is that uh, we would learn what it means to live an authentic Christian life. It's a simple thing philosophy and it's a simple message but I think sometimes we we kind of get it wrong we've made the Christian life say something that it doesn't really say we live out the Christian experience simply because we've learned how to live the Christian experience and our thoughts as it revolves around this are, are kind of like sometimes disturbing because we have kind of lulled ourselves sometimes into the thinking that the Christian life is is something that kind of culture determines is the way that we should live and you can live the Christian life without being a real Christian. I see lots of people doing that. They just love the Lord. They love to do things right. They love to be charitable. They love to go to church. They love to read the Bible. They even love to pray. And yet there is no guarantee that just because you're living this Christian life that you are the real deal. And so we've been talking about what it means to be the real deal. And we've been looking at this under the subject of, we've called it 40 days of the proof. And for 40 days, we're talking about the proof of what it really means to be a Christ follower. And Jesus, early on in his ministry, Matthew 5, he's already just begun his ministry, is telling you what it's like to be in the kingdom. Because we all know we're not of this kingdom, we're of another kingdom. And in order to get on well in that kingdom, we have to live according to the rules of that kingdom and not this kingdom. Don't get them too confused. We started by talking just a quick recap about how to get into the kingdom. And we said we get into the kingdom by... Oh, I've lost it again. Yeah. We get into the kingdom. Phil, can you stick your thing up? We get into the kingdom. Next one. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. Blessed are those who, who mourn. You get into the kingdom by, sorry, poor in spirit. This is your entry point into the kingdom of God where we declare there's nothing good of myself. We declare that I am spiritually bankrupt 
and we declare that God without you I'm never going to cut this thing I will never live the Christian life on my own so many people think they can do it on their own and they think if I could just go to more self-help programs and do things better that I would be able to get into the kingdom of heaven nobody comes into the kingdom of heaven walking proudly you come into the kingdom of heaven as a beggar that's the truth of what that is the words that we spoke about you come begging God for salvation you don't stay there but that's how you get into the kingdom the second aspect of all the other verses are those of what it's like to live in the kingdom you get in there because you're humble and you're poor in spirit you acknowledge your dependence on God your bankruptcy once you're in the kingdom you, t you take on a new lifestyle the lifestyle looks like this where we mourn over sin we see the abhorrent nature of this thing called sin we have so euphemized and rationalized and accepted sin that I don't think we would know sin if it punched us on the nose sometime because we've become so used to it. But when we begin to mourn over sin and we see how sin offends the holy God and how God hates sin because of what it does to us, that's a sign that you're in the kingdom. Are you mourning over your sin, people? Out of that comes the spirit of meekness. And meekness is the beauty of strength and control. You know, Jesus is a beautiful picture of power under control. He's a meek person. We're not talking about weakness. We're talking about meekness. And the definition we gave of meekness was power under control. As Jesus hung on that cross, there was power under control. He still, as he hung there, and they stuck a spear in his side and they crucified him to death, Jesus was still the power source. He was still in control. People didn't think so. They looked at him and said, what kind of God are you? What kind of Messiah are you? We don't expect Messiahs to be hanging around on, on a cross. But Jesus in his meekness could have called all of heaven's armies and rescued him from the cross, wiped out mankind and started all under, over again. But Jesus, the epitome of meekness, was power under control. And then we spoke on Sunday, and Wes Hamilton did a great job of talking about what it means to hunger and thirst for for righteousness too many of us hunger and thirst for more money too many of us hunger and thirst for more prestige and more power and more popularity and, and and jesus says you will know you're in the kingdom of god when you hunger and thirst for righteousness that's where we got to tonight i want to move on and uh we're going to talk about what it means to be merciful what it means to be merciful now, in the culture in which Jesus was on this earth for, we need to take a look at uh, how this contradicted the very culture of the world at that particular time. We see how Jesus came into a world that was governed by two, two primary forces. The first one was the political force of the day, the Romans. The Romans were not a very merciful group of people. The Romans were very creative in learning how to kill people. The Romans shed a lot of blood. There was not a lot of mercy in the political system of the day. The Romans had, had, had lions and, and they had torture chambers and they, they were very creative in their ways of finding ways to kill people. There was not a lot of mercy in the ways that they would do things in the world of politics in those days. The Romans glorified power and, and lording it over people. They glorified justice. And they glorified all of those things. And then along came Jesus into that culture, preaching, blessed are the merciful. It would have been totally counterintuitive for somebody to have a teaching like that and be accepted in the political situation of the day. Then Jesus came along into, into the religious world. Got the political world on one side, religious world on the other side. The religious world was Judaism, was the world in which Jesus came into, where they had glorified the law. And it was all about justice. It was all about God's anger and God's wrath being poured out upon you if you sinned. And there was not a lot of mercy in those days. Do you remember the account of Jesus talking to the woman caught in adultery? And there was this woman as she was thrown before Jesus. And the people said to Jesus, they said, Jesus, judge her. And Jesus said, how should I judge her? And they said, according to what? The law, judge her. The religious system had no grace. There was no mercy. There was no love, there was no compassion, there was no understanding. Nothing was done redemptively. Everything was done judgmentally according to the law. The religious system of the day did not have a lot of mercy. 
And it's into this world that Jesus came. The authorities of the day were unmerciful. The religious system of the day didn't understand mercy. And Jesus came along and he said, Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And so when we, we look at this, we see the message of mercy coming into this most incredibly unmerciful society. But let me just put a quick misnomer to rest over here. There are some things that I know I've even said to my own kids, and, and they're, they're certainly not biblical at all. Well, we have said to people, if you will show mercy, then people will be merciful towards you. Have you heard that? We say, you be kind to other people, and they will be kind to you. Well, if that were true, let me ask you, why did they take the kindest, most merciful man who ever lived and crucify him? Why did they take the epitome of mercy and kindness and beat him and put a crown of thorns on his head and nail him to a cross and kill him? Mercy does not demand mercy. Mercy does not necessarily engender mercy from other people. Mercy does not generate mercy from others. There are no guarantees that mercy shown will mean mercy received. If that was true, if that was the truth, they would have made Jesus king. They would have made him the king and said, you are the most merciful man in the world. We love mercy. We want you to be the king. Instead, they took this most merciful, kind man, and they killed him. The world has never liked mercy. Just have a look at TV at the moment. And you look around the world at, at some of the acts. Huh. I, I want to know. There was one today, and I don't want to gross you out, but there was a picture on the news just before I came this evening of, a, of an ISIS member and a little six-year-old kid with a gun in his hand, and this little six-year-old kid was instructed to shoot a particular person. And they put the gun in his hand, and they made the six-year-old kid kill a man because he had connections with Israel. And they shot, this kid shot this man. At six years old, and I'm thinking, I, I'm just blown away. There's not a lot of mercy out there, people. Not a lot of mercy. Beheadings, horrible things taking place. The world has not really changed that much, has it? So with the misnomer says that if misnomer says that if, if I give mercy, then it's probably going to be that people are going to give me mercy. Don't believe it. If it does happen, it's unlikely. Now. When we look at the source of mercy, which is what I want to do right now, I want to tell you where mercy comes from. Some people will think that some people are more merciful than others simply because of their biology or because of their genetic makeup. Some people are more compassionate, more understanding, and, and, and more merciful simply because of the genes that they have. And there's an element of, of human truth over there. There are some people who may be like that. But the source of mercy actually comes from God. There are a lot of non-Christians or unbelieving people who are doing very merciful things, but the source of their mercy is not the same as the source of our mercy. Jesus told an incredible parable about the source of mercy, mercy in Matthew chapter 18. And it spoke about the unmerciful servant. Do you remember that? Like, did you redo your homework, by the way? I hope you read the passages. This was one of them. Mike, did you read your passages? Oh, he's, yeah, right. Jesus told a story of, of a king who had a, a man who owed him a lot of money and uh, he loaned this man millions of rand and uh, then a couple of years later he saw this man he said hey man I, want, I need my money back you know can you give me my money and the man began to plead for mercy he said oh king I can't give you mercy your, your money back because I have kind of spent it and it's been a bad year in the business and the kids are in high school and I got university fees and, and health bills to pay and, and I, I just can't pay you back and the king, in the presence of many people, looked at him and said, oh, okay, that's cool. I'll just forgive you. I'll forgive you. And the guy said, you, you mean I don't have to pay you back? He said, not a cent. You're out of here. Anyway, that man was overjoyed. He walked outside, and he was followed by a couple of the people in the courts, Jesus said. And as he got outside, he saw a man who owed him 20 rand. He ran across the road, and he grabbed this man, Jesus said, and he began to throttle him. And he says, I want my 20 rand. Anyway, the guy who was watching this went back to the king. He said, hey, king, I've just seen the strangest thing. 
And the king said, what did you see? He said, you know that guy that you just forgave a couple of million rand just like that? Well, he's outside the door throttling to death somebody who owes him 20 bucks. The king freaked out. He said, bring him back. Grabbed that man, brought him back into his presence, bound him up and threw him into jail and said, until you've paid back every single cent, you will rot in jail. Jesus says, when you receive mercy, the moral of the parable is a simple moral. Mercy received means mercy to be given. When you receive the mercy of God, and boy, do we need that. Anybody here not need that? When you receive the mercy of God, God said, I expect you now to give mercy to others. So when Jesus says, don't expect other people to give mercy back to you, he's not really saying, you know, that the, the reason um, is that, that we don't give mercy for mercy's sake. We give mercy because we've been recipients of mercy. If you have received the mercy of God, people, you have to give it back to other people. So the source of the greatest mercy we need to talk about is that it comes from our relationship and the forgiveness that God has given to us. If you're a believer, you are obliged, according to the passage, to give mercy to others simply because you have received it. Let's move on. The second thing I want to talk about is the meaning of mercy. Now, there is a thing that we, we do in theology, and, and if you ever go to a Bible college or do some decent theological stuff, and they, 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 where they do critical, they call it critical comparisons, where they, cr they sort of compare words together that are similarly used in order to find out the true meaning of the words. Now, mercy sounds a lot like forgiveness. Mercy sounds a lot like love. Mercy sounds a lot like grace. And so there are a whole lot of contemporary words. Now, I did this with you a while back, a couple of years back, I seem to recall. And it, 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 it's, it bears good, good teaching again. I'm going to do a quick word comparison for you and see if you get it. If you have a look at the difference between mercy and forgiveness. Let me tell you this. Mercy is much bigger than forgiveness. Okay. So we see here mercy is bigger than forgiveness. Okay. You know why it's bigger? Because if you have a look at some of the illustrations, have a look at the, the story of, of the Good Samaritan. Great story. Great story. He was the recipient of mercy down there in the gutter. He wasn't the recipient of forgiveness. Forgiveness was something that must have to be given to him to be the source of the mercy. So when the Good Samaritan got down in the gutter with that Jewish man who hated him, the Jewish man who was probably a businessman and despised the Samaritan man, forgiveness was given and the result of forgiveness was seen in mercy. But mercy as an action is far bigger than forgiveness. It is much bigger than that. Now, if you want to compare mercy and love. Mercy is less than love. Love is much bigger than mercy. I know that because I've read 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 says this, even though I give my body to be burned, and even though I gave away all my money to the poor, and even though I offer myself up as a human sacrifice for mankind, if I have not got what? Love, I am nothing. So love is much bigger than mercy. Mercy is less than love. Let's do a study between mercy and grace. Mercy and grace. Grace is beautiful. Let me tell you what grace does. Grace forgives and mercy gives a better position in life. That's the story of Mephibosheth, which you also should have read if you've done your homework. It was the story of Mephibosheth where, where David gave forgiveness to Mephibosheth, not because Mephibosheth had done anything wrong, but because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time being born into this world by the wrong set of parents. But there was a beautiful sense in which David called Mephibosheth and should have taken his life but he didn't do that. He said he forgave him all the sins of his father and everybody out there. And he said, I'm not just going to forgive you by grace, but I'm also going to show you incredible mercy. And you're going to sit at my seat and you're going to sit at the table next to me. And I'm going to give you what you don't deserve. I'm going to give you the best of everything. And so we see that mercy 
and grace are kind of different. So we see here that mercy and forgiveness, that, that mercy is bigger than forgiveness, but love is much bigger than mercy. And we see that grace is overwhelmingly different to this thing that we call mercy. They are two different things. And then if you want to take it a step further, you could do a comparison between mercy and, strangely enough, justice. Why do we need mercy? Because God demands justice. And if God demands justice, then his act of mercy to us is overwhelmingly huge. Now, when you look at these different things, you know, and we see mercy and justice, let me say this to you. When mercy and justice kiss, that's where we have redemption. Because God demands justice for our sin. Are you keeping with me here? God demands justice for our sin, but he gives us mercy. It's a beautiful thing. When mercy and justice kissed, that's when redemption happens. And the most beautiful thing about it is simply this, that though I, I kind of act out mercy and justice and when, when they kiss, now forgiveness is no longer a violation to God's justice. Think about that for a moment. Forgiveness violates God's desire for justice. But mercy is so beautiful that mercy gives us forgiveness, that, and when mercy and justice kiss, we cannot violate God's justice anymore. So we see this. Mercy is bigger than forgiveness. Mercy is much less than love. Mercy and grace are completely different, and mercy and justice coexist at the point of them kissing one another. I love that terminology. It's biblical. That's when redemption takes place. So you see where mercy kind of fits into this whole deal. It is, it is different to grace. It is not as big as love, but man, it is an amazing thing. Let me now take you to some of the characteristics of, of mercy, and you will see you can kind of measure yourself here. Um, and I just want you to measure yourself. Don't measure me. Don't measure the church. Just measure yourself. See if you pick up on some of these characteristics of mercy. First thing I want you to notice is that mercy is sensitive there was no mercy in Rome nobody was sensitive to the needs of others there was just cruelty there was not a lot of kindness but mercy is incredibly sensitive I have a, one of my favorite movies is a movie called Patch Adams have you ever watched that movie Robin Williams that is I think it is best and, I, and, and, and one of the lines in this is where Patch Adams is standing before the the jury of all the professors of the university, and they're giving him a hard time. And he says this. He says, indifference is, do you remember it? Is the greatest disease of the soul. What his thesis is this, that the opposite of love is not hate, but just indifference. Indifference. Indifference means, oh man, I acknowledge your need. But man, there's not a lot I can do about it. That's indifference. Indifference means I see your need. But you know what? I've got my own needs, set of needs as well. That's indifference. There's a word that we use, and you will remember this word, called a scotoma. Do you remember what a scotoma is? I think Chad mentioned it a while back here in, in church when he preached last. A scotoma is a blind spot. It's a Greek word for a blind spot. We have them all the time. I have a set of keys that I will lose all the time. And I'll say to Helene, and I'll say, Helene, have you seen my, my keys? And she'll say, you knucklehead, you left them on the, on the table in the kitchen. I say, no, I didn't. I've just checked there. I've just looked there. And I didn't see my keys on the table. Don't get smart. You know? And she said, come with me. Very patient. And I look on the table, and I good night. The keys are on the table, and I think I've been tricked. You know? And it, it, it's a scotoma. I see, but I just don't see. I hear, but I just don't hear. We who live in South Africa have become scotomerized to some of the challenges that our communities face. You know why? Because we see it all the time. It becomes like a callus. A scotoma is just a blind spot. Now, Athena will know this, actually. Don't, 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 don't jump on this one. Let me illustrate a scotoma to you. I want you to, to add up these numbers in your head, okay? It's very easy. Um, now, even Brian could do this thing. It's very, very easy, okay? I want you to add these numbers. I want you to add 1,000 plus 40. Plus a thousand, plus thirty, plus a thousand, plus twenty, plus a thousand, plus ten. What do you got? Five thousand. How many do you say five thousand? Joe Sparrow, you are a teacher. All the five thousanders? 
Okay. <laughs> Do it again. 1,000 plus 40 plus 1,000 plus 30 plus 1,000 plus 20 plus 1,000 plus 10. Is there anybody who still thinks it's 5,000? Okay. Are you, now, those of you, that's very easy mass, but I, I, I went on a course once where the guy did this with me. I'm very arrogant. And, and he was saying, it's 4,100. I'm saying, no, 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 no. It's 5,000. I can add. I went to school. I'm not stupid. And I argued with this guy. I said, it is 5,000. Anyway, then he took a board and he wrote, I was so embarrassed. And he said, no, don't feel bad. He said, all you had was a scotoma. You just had a scotoma you saw, but you didn't see. You heard, but you didn't hear. And we have scotomas that have desensitized us. Now, it's quite funny when it comes to mass, but it is tragic when it comes to issues of life. We live in a nation full of incredible challenges and needs. But the tragedy is we can drive past those things and not even raise a pulse and not even give it sometimes a second look. You say, what's happened here? We've just become desensitized. There's a, there's a beautiful illustration of this when you, when you look at um, the story of, of the um, blind Bartimaeus. You'll find him in Mark chapter 10. Blind Bartimaeus was a blind man. He had sat forever sitting at the gate, and he was a, a beggar. And uh, he cried out, Jesus, have mercy on me. He heard that Jesus was in town and that possibly Jesus could heal him. So with a very loud voice, he cries out time after time, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, have, have mercy on me. Jesus, I'm over here. Jesus, where are you? I'm blind. Jesus, and everybody got fed up with the guy. He said, bottom man, be quiet, man. Jesus has not got time for people like you. You be quiet. We have no time. Just sit there and be quiet. And, and the crowd was not sensitive to his need. Not because they didn't think he had a problem. Oh, they knew he had a problem. But they had known and seen his problem far too many times. They had become desensitized to the problem of this blind man. You know you have a problem of desensitivity when that happens with us. There was a, a, a recent questionnaire that was kind of done amongst churches that sort of illustrates this. And I say this with, with all kindness. They asked the congregation, what do you think the role of your pastor is? And apparently 80 to 90% of the congregation said the role of the pastor is to teach us, to feed us, and to make sure that not too many of us run away. That's the role of the pastor. Only about 10% of the congregation said that pastor is here to save the lost. Now, when the same question was asked to a bunch of pastors, the opposite answer was given. The pastors were saying, man, I'm here to fulfill the Great Commission. I'm here to evangelize the world. I'm here to, to save the world. I, I, my job is to preach the gospel and to make Christians. The two did not even agree. The congregation is saying, you're here to feed us and make us feel comfortable and make us feel nice and give us nice stuff. The, and, and, and he's saying, but, but I don't agree with that. My role is to get out into the world, communicate Christ to you, and kick you out of your comfort zone so that you can do the same thing. The churches did not buy that. Now, if the church and the congregation can't even agree on this, we have a problem about the role of simply what a pastor is there to do. The congregations, and I speak with great kindness, have become desensitized to the magnitude of people dying and going to hell. Do you get that? They're dying. And they're going to hell and the congregations are worried about the temperature of the church room, you know. And, I, and, 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 oh man, we sang for far too long today. And that song was in the wrong key. You know, and I can't sing that long. You know, and, oh man, we have become desensitized to the real meaning of what a church is there to do. Stick that in your cap and smoke it, okay? All right. The third thing. Mercy is sensitive. Mercy is sensitive, but I'm just going to add on to this. Not always sensible. Jesus told a parable that illustrated this. He told a, a parable about a, a man who had a, 
a job to do. He was a wealthy man, so he needed to get a whole lot of people to come and work for him on his farm. So he goes down to where all the, the labor sit, hoping that they're going to get a job for the day, kind of like outside FT over here, where all those men gr gravitate to in the morning, just hoping that somebody's going to come past it and offer them a job for, for the day. Anyway, this man went down at 6 o'clock in the morning, Jesus said, and he took a crew home and he put them to work. He agreed on a, on a payment for them and they started work. 9 o'clock, he saw the job wasn't going too fast, so he went down, he got some more, brought them back. 12 o'clock, he went back and he got some more. 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus said, he went back and he got some more workers. Now, they'd knock off at 6 in the evening. At 5 o'clock in the evening, Jesus said, the same man went back and he got the other guys and said, the job is not yet finished. Will you come and work for me? Now, who's left at the end of the day? All the strong guys were chosen, first of all. At the end of the day, you've got people who worked for one hour, and they were the weakest of all of the team that were up there to be chosen. And he says, he says when it came time to be paid, crazy. Jesus paid them all the same. He gave the same amount of money to the guy who worked for 12 solid hours, the strong guy, and he gave them the same salary to the guy who had been working for one hour, and he was a weak wimp. And, 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 the, and the weak wimp comes and he says, well, this is so cool. Can I come back tomorrow? The guy who had worked for 12 hours was disgusted. He was off to his trade union and he was off to the, whatever, the, the CCMA and he was going to sue this guy. And, and because he, this was just not fair. And Jesus answers and says, do not I have the right to give to people that which I want? What belongs to me, I can give away as freely as I would like to give. And then he says this, which is most intriguing. He says, I have the right to do this. In the kingdom of God, let me tell you this, there are no rights. You cannot say, God, that's not fair. Why did you bless? God, why did you heal that person over there and you haven't healed me? God, why is it that you've given that guy success in his business and my business is flowering? That's not fair. Lord, I too have rights. You have no rights, baby. Because God will give as he decides to give. He's not being mean. He has a reason and a purpose for doing those things. Now, when God chose his team for the world, you'll notice he doesn't always choose the strong and the clever and the app learned. And he chooses the weak of the world to confound the strong. And I, and I, and I think, man, when God chose me, he didn't make a terribly sensible choice, you know. But he certainly made a merciful one. And that's wherein lies the truth of that parable that Jesus is telling you about. This parable was not about economics and how to run your business. The parable Jesus told was about mercy. And mercy is not always sensible. You can't work this one out. Let me say this to you. Add one more on here. Mercy is sensitive, but not always sensitive. sensitive but sensible but it is always sacrificial. That's what makes mercy so difficult to give because it requires sacrifice. There is a convenient form of mercy out there, and it's just a convenient one. But true mercy is always sacrificial by nature. I know that because when I look in the Bible, I'll give you an illustration. You know, you look at the names of Jesus. What are some of the names? He's called the Son of God. He's called the Son of Man. Mark talks a lot about the Son of Man. He's called the Bridegroom. He's also called the Lamb of, of God. One of the most beautiful names of Jesus was the Lamb of God. Why did God give him that name? Let me tell you why. Because Jesus came to be a sacrificial lamb all through the old testament we have this old testament tradition the religious day where they would bring a lamb to the high priest a perfect lamb you couldn't bring a sick lamb a deformed one one with a broken leg you had to find the most perfect lamb you had bring it to the high priest you'd kill that little guy pour the blood on the altar and you would have a dead lamb one day on the mount of calvary god arrived at his own sacrifice and he brought jesus the lamb of god to take away the sin of the world, the ultimate act of mercy, where Jesus was given as the very sacrificial lamb of God. There is no blessing 
without sacrifice. There is no mercy given without sacrifice being shed. So, that's the tough thing. People don't want to sacrifice nowadays. Everybody wants to you know, hold on to everything. Everybody wants to, wants to keep it for themselves. But the beauty of what Jesus does was it was a culmination of the most merciful act ever done. Where he, the Lamb of God, sacrificed his life for us. So here we have it, people. You know, we have these, the source of mercy. Where do you get mercy? You get mercy from when you know that you've received it. When you have received the mercy of God as per the first parable, you need to know God is watching to see if mercy received is going to lead to mercy given. That's the first thing. That we measure or we can, the meaning of mercy, sorry, is, is where is, mercy is much bigger than forgiveness. Mercy is less than love. Mercy is different from grace. And mercy is at one with justice at the point at which they kiss characteristics of mercy mercy is always sensitive when you go to work tomorrow why don't you have a look around you and just pray that god would remove maybe some of the scotomas you have on your eyes that you begin to see people through the eyes of god incredibly sinful many of them but incredibly loved and when you begin to see people like that sensitivity will arise we need to know that that the characteristic of mercy is is sensitive. It's not always sensible because sacrifice is, is a tough thing to do. But mercy is sensitive. It's not always sensible, but it is always sacrificial. Let's just pray. Lord, this thing called mercy, I'm not sure I've explained it that well. But God, I am blown away by it. The fact that you would be the merciful lamb of God who would shed his blood so that I could receive mercy, so that I could be forgiven because mercy is bigger than forgiveness and forgiveness is a fruit of mercy. Thank you for the wonder of your incredible love for us. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord, that at that sacrificial time, mercy and justice kissed and redemption became a possibility. That's incredible. The depths of these truths, God just blows my little mind that the God of heaven should do this for us. But Lord, as we leave from here tonight, I would want for you just maybe to, to help me with this, Lord. I need to challenge these people here tonight, first of all, to say, have they received of your mercy? Because if they haven't, they need to. That any nice thing that they do, that they think they're being merciful, will mean nothing in the context of eternity unless they have received your mercy where they acknowledge and they speak directly to you and say, God, did you really do that for me? Did you really lay down your life as a sacrificial lamb for me? God, I want to thank you for that. And I come humbly to receive the redemption that comes from that. Thank you for what you've done for me. Folks, I don't know. But if there are people here tonight that kind of look at this thing called mercy and say, man, I haven't a clue what this guy's talking about. I've never received mercy like that. Well, I pray that tonight would be your night, that you would receive of the bounty of God's mercy for you. You may need to take some time, people, to talk to God about that. If you need to talk to somebody else, there's people here who you know, leaders in our church, pastors on our staff, elders who are here tonight, who would be more than happy to talk to you about that. But Lord, we want to thank you. For those of us who have received of the mercy of God now, the challenge is, are we willing to give it? Because this is the proof of whether we are living the authentic Christian life. Pray, Lord, that as we wake up tomorrow, scotomas would be removed, that we would see people through different eyes, 
and that we would be willing to give mercy where mercy is needed, not so that we can receive mercy because that's unlikely to happen, but simply to give it because we have received it from you. And that's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.